Hello, my name is Miss Lewin. I'm Head of Geography at Homer Green Senior School. I'm sure I know many of you already. Um, I have put together the presentation for you today um, just to introduce you to the course um, and what we study here at Homer Green in terms of A-level geography. Um, there is also a few slides that give you a little bit of a taster um, as to what your lessons um, will be like once you start the A-level course. And then I'm going to give you some information about the bridging tasks that I would like to see you complete um, before I get to meet you properly in September. Hello. Hi. So as you can see from the table that I've put here on the first slide, um, the A-level that we study is a linear A-level, which means the two years study um, is what is assessed at the end of year 13. So there's no exams in year 12. Um, everything is assessed formally at the end of year 13 for you to gain your qualification. So it's a two year course. The exam board that we use uh, or follow here at Homer Green is the AQA, um, which means that the A-level um, follows on very well from the GCSE that the majority of you have sat um, if you have studied at Homer Green previously, um, but actually it's designed in a way that the majority of exam boards feed into it quite nicely anyway. Um, we dedicate four hours per week in terms of a lesson time to, to our lessons together. Um, usually that's divided up two hours of physical, two hours of human geography, um, and you should have two separate teachers for that. It's usually myself, Miss Lewin, I'm head of geography, and Mr Stockton as well. In terms of assessment, we do weekly kit tests. So those of you that have previously been to Green will know they are linked to knowledge. They're slightly different to what you would have done at GCSE. It's more kind of extended writing that I expect you to be able to um, produce at the beginning of a lesson, assessing what you learnt previously. And then we do your regular AP assessment point assessments to kind of check in in terms of where your knowledge is at, what you are understanding well and what you possibly need me to go over or more support with.
Okay, so moving on to thinking about the A-level specification itself and how your A-level is broken up into the different elements or components that it requires you to study. Um, component one is all the physical geography. Um, eventually, that will be assessed as one paper um, that's two and a half hours long and worth 120 marks, 40% of your A-level. Uh, section A will be on the compulsory element of the physical geography, which is water and carbon cycles. Uh, water and carbon cycles is quite a science topic. Um, it follows on quite nicely from some of your GCSE knowledge um, and brings in actually some of your, no your knowledge of science as well. But it actually gives the foundations for the topics in physical geography that we then go on to study. Um, so it kind of covers the core knowledge that's needed for that physical geography. Uh, section B um, is actually an optional section. So as a, as a school, we opt for the one, the topic within that that's the most uh, suitable we feel for our students. So for that, we opted for coastal systems, which is a step up from your GCSE knowledge on coasts, a little bit more sophisticated in terms of language and uh, what you're expected to know and understand in terms of case studies but really, really interesting topic and often one that people use um, as part of their NEA, which I'll talk about in just a second. Section C is where we've opted again for hazards following on from GCSE. Um, everyone tends to prefer uh, hazards to most topics in their geography. So it's just a popular one that we decided to stick with and um, continue to teach. Component two is the same again, but it's all about the human side of geography. Again, will eventually be assessed as a separate exam. Two and a half hours long again, 120 marks, 40% of the A-level as well. Um, there is less optional element in terms of the human geography. So the two topics that we have to study um, from that section A, global systems and governance, which is really interesting. Um, a lot of students really enjoy that once they kind of get their head around some of the concepts. It's all about how countries are run, the diff different governments, how they operate, and actually how as a, as a world and a, as a um, globe we're becoming more interconnected with each other. And that sharing of resources and ideas um, has changed the way we live and how we produce food, manufacture goods, travel, everything like that. Section B, change in places, really kind of abstract topic. Um, people love to hate it a little bit. Um, it's one of those that it's so conceptual that there is, in some ways, not really a right or wrong answer, but you have to obviously understand the theory in order to come to any kind of um, decision if it is a, a debate style question that you're expected to answer. And that's the one I'm actually going to focus on as part of the taste of lesson today, because it's the one that kind of makes you think, um, which is what brings out that geographer in people as we move through A-level geography. Section C, um, contemporary urban environments is the option that we, we chose um, out of those three. It follows on quite nicely from urban issues and challenges um, if you studied that at GCSE. Um, and again, it's quite closely linked with the other topics. So it just means that everything kind of is quite complementary and fits in quite nicely together. Finally, component three, um, I mentioned an NEA a, a little while ago, that means um, or stands for non-examined assessment, which is essentially a piece of coursework. Now, this coursework comes in the form of a geographic investigation. Uh, very similar to a dissertation, actually. Those of you that may know somebody who has been to or is studying at university, um, it's a three to four thousand word geographical investigation that you decide upon in terms of um, topic and title. You obviously write independently and conduct all the data collection, write up, assessing, analysing, all of that kind of thing. And that is marked by me um, as your class teacher. And then it is sent off to the AQA to be moderated and quality controlled to ensure that it is um, representative of, of what I've said. And that accounts for 
the final 20% of the A level. So it's well worth doing a, a good job on that um, because to have a fifth of your A level in your hands before you even sit any exams um, is definitely a very valuable thing to do well.
Okay, so, so thinking, about thinking about the lesson taste or that I mentioned previously, I just wanted to, yeah, give you a bit of an insight into what A-level geography lessons may be like and the sorts of things that we will um, discuss and the sorts of topics that will come up. So I've chosen the changing places theme, um, which we'll go into in just a second. And then um, I have incorporated a task, a very simple task that I'd like you to try and complete for me and send me a copy of by Friday the 10th of July. Um, I would also be setting a series of other bridging tasks um, just to make sure that obviously some preparation is happening before I finally get to meet you and teach you properly. So please keep on checking your emails regularly for any bridging work tasks, which I will be setting um, regularly. So when you first hear or think about the word place, um, you think it's, you know, quite a boring word, really. It just is what it is, isn't it? It's one of the most basic yet, yet important concepts within geography, because without places, then this subject doesn't really have much to say or much to or much value within it. So what is actually meant by that term? OK, so a definitive point on a map is kind of the dictionary definition. Um, within that, we think about the human and physical characteristics of a particular location that make it that place. Um, and then within human geography, within this topic, we start to think more about the emotional experiences of somewhere. OK, so actually what a place might mean to you versus what that place might mean to the person next to you. And that can be very different and that place can have a very different holding in somebody's life or uh, different people have different opinions on, on a place for very many, many different reasons. And places are often um, represented by something that's linked to them. So that could be a piece of artwork, it could be a famous photograph, it could be a film that was set in that particular place. So it's something that is put out to the rest of the world and allows them to gain what they think is a realistic insight into what that place is like, but actually could be very um, misinterpreted or misunderstood. I think the majority of people that I know would think they know exactly what New York City is like, for example, um, having been there or not, um, purely because most films that you think of are set or have some scenes that are set in, in New York City. So we all get this picture of a very busy, built up place, lots of yellow taxis, lots of crime. And some of that may be true. Um, but for some people, that is their home. That is where they potentially grew up and their feelings about New York City and their experiences of that place are very, very different to what we get shown in films. So that's just one example of what this topic starts to try and break down and, and think about. So not to confuse you in the first five minutes of studying A-level geography, but there is actually a quite stark difference between the idea of a place and the idea of a space. Okay, so a space could be anywhere, a location with no meaning or value, and it's more of an abstract concept. So just a space, a open area between two different things, a, like a parking space, a space that is just an open field, anything like that. OK, but a, a place is, a, is an actual location. OK, the size of that place doesn't matter. OK, that place can literally be your bedroom. OK, which is some people's favourite place to be. And the existence of space with meaning and objectives of human experiences attached to them and the things that give it some kind of context is what makes it a place and instead of just a space. 
So, um, usually quite a lot of people laugh when I ask questions like this that link to the local area, whether it be Holmer Green or High Wycombe. Um, so, what is your perception of High Wycombe? Uh, just think about it for a minute. Do you know it very, very well? Have you lived here all your life? Have your family lived here all their lives? All their lives? Are you somebody that's very, very much, you know, Wycombe born and bred? Have you moved here at some point in your life? Have you um, moved here recently? That makes a difference to your perception of High Wycombe. So we have a, an insider's view um, because we live here. So the things that we know about High Wycombe, obviously people wouldn't necessarily know. But if you think about what High Wycombe is, is famous for um, or what people think about when they think about High Wycombe, then that might start to give you an idea about perception. Okay, so High Wycombe is famous for its um, chair making, traditionally. So that's where the chair factory <coughs> um, would have would have been. And obviously that's why our local football team, Wycombe Wanderers, is known as the Chair Boys. Um, it's also got the River Y running running through it, so that's why the where the High Wycombe part comes from. Um, that river cuts through down at the Rye, which is obviously quite a popular recreation ground for young people in the area as well. And um, other than that, it's actually um, a commuter town. So because of our quite strong links to the um, London railway services, we actually have a, quite a large population of people who live and work um, or live in Wickham but work in London. Um, so that, again, gives us a little bit of a difference in terms of what we know and experience. Um, in terms of perception of the people, um, obviously it's quite a multicultural town. Um, we've got lots of different ethnic groups that live um, mostly very peacefully um, alongside each other. Um, we've got some areas where there is um, obviously more built up, um, compact kind of housing towards town centre and then obviously we've got areas that verging on far more rural. So out here in Holmer Green um, where houses are probably a bit bigger, there's a bit, bit more open space um, around. So we've got quite a range of, of different kind of um, characteristics, both naturally in terms of the physical landscapes and all of our hills, um, but as well we've got a wide variation of um, housing and facilities as well. So as I mentioned previously with, with places and with how places get their reputations or what people think of when they, they hear the name of a place, often it's to do with what brings that, that place to life. So what are the different forms of media that can, that can actually do that? Um, and I mentioned television. So as soon as something is set somewhere, people automatically start to think of that place being exactly as it's portrayed in the television programme or film. Um, so that often becomes quite a strong attachment um, to, to that place, how the media represents it. We obviously have other things as well. So obviously when crimes occur, um, and that's reported by the newspapers or news programmes, that also gives people a lot more kind of food for thought in terms of what that place is like as well. So in a more of a negative way, potentially, um, but also they may have never even heard of that place, but now they do. And now every time they hear the name of it, they're gonna think of the, the crime maybe that happened or was committed there. Um, other things in the positive are things like music festivals or events that kind of happen or have happened um, more regularly for a few years. So, for example, locally we've had Penn Festival, um, obviously Penn Street, the fields out towards Penn Street and Witchmore Hill are, well, in the middle of nowhere really, but actually a lot of people travelled from miles and miles away to attend 
and fest so actually their representation or their um understanding of that place is a lot more kind of real than it may have been previously okay so i found this quote um from a geographer and i really like it so i thought i'd share it with you so places gather experiences and histories even languages and thoughts think only of what it means to go back to a place you know finding it full of memories and expectations old things and new things the familiar and the strange and much more besides so this topic really gets people to think of a place not just being somewhere random somewhere where people live or somewhere that is on a map okay we think about what places actually mean to people and how your fondest childhood memories are probably strongly associated with somewhere as well as the people that you were with when those memories were made um and actually places can hold really strong meanings to people and can be really powerful in terms of memories and how their memories are shaped and their experiences are shaped moving moving forward in their lives both positively and, and negatively um a lot of singer songwriters are inspired by the places that they've visited and the 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 memories that those places hold for them as well so it's it's quite a creative side of geography and uh, a lot of people really kind of think a lot more about their own life and their own experiences throughout this topic so it's, it's quite nice um so thinking about what form of representation uh, cleverly accesses the elements of the above quote to represent to create a representation of place so can you think of any okay so this is the part where you guys are gonna probably come into your own because you'll know um tricks that i potentially don't so thinking about what modern day obsession i call it um influences our perception of places now um a lot more than the traditional adverts would have done so think about it okay what do you spend half your life doing and what do you spend half your life <coughs> stalking people on looking through, looking through photos looking at people's lives where they've visited and with that looking at the places that come along with that okay so just in case i wasn't obvious enough i was talking about social media okay so social media is powerful um we all know about the negative connotations that are associated with social media and all the different things that it has and maybe changed in terms of life and what it causes and the problems that can happen but actually it's really powerful in terms of what it does for places so <clears throat> As I said, we are what is known as an insider when it comes to I reckon because we know it. We've lived here for however long, short time, long time, doesn't really matter. Um, you have that insider perspective because you've you've been here more than once and you you have that day to day understanding of how the town operates. But if you were to go on Instagram uh, or any other social media um, platform really and search High Wickham or hashtag High Wickham or hashtag Wickham any of the ones that are just publicly added to general kind of Instagram pages you will see a vast array of images um, come up when you you look at that and those images immediately would give somebody on the outside um a view or a perception of what this town is like so some of the photos are probably a little bit out there um some of the photos um are probably just personal photographs that have just been sort of located using the hashtag because that's where those people are 
But if you just scroll through and look through some of the more general photographs, which give you more of an idea about what the town like looks like or what's going on in the town. OK, what sorts of things do you notice? OK, so what stands out to you? Is there anything that's linked to the natural landscape in those photos? Is there anything that's linked to any of the, the businesses maybe that operate? Um, what the people are like? Um, the sorts of events that go on, um, potentially what the um, sort of uh, young people are, are doing, getting up to, thinking about all those types of things, scrolling through these images, okay, which ones for you give you a representation of the town in some way. Um, try not to, as I say, go towards any that are a bit kind of bizarre because people have just used the hashtag. Try and focus on ones that give you something in terms of geographical link to that to that place. So for your task, um, which you'll find on the next slide, uh, the layout that I'd like you to use, if you can recreate the table, I'd like you to select some of the images. So try and, as I said, use a couple of uh, the physical landscape, some maybe of, of people, um, trying to think about what those represent and discuss what perception you think that gives you of the town. OK, so, for example, is if there is any of the physical landscape, does it give you a perception that it is quite built up or is it quite an open, open area? People, does it show um, a lot of multiculturalism uh, or not, as the case may be? Um, and think about, think does, about does the, perception the perception on Instagram, so what so other people would see if they searched Hoekham, match what your own perception is as a local person? OK, and that's going to start you off with the right kind of thinking that I need you to, to have ready for this topic in September. OK, so the difference between what is put out there to us about somewhere and what that place actually is like or what it might mean maybe to someone else. OK, so that's the task that I would like you. OK, so thank you for listening. I would far rather be um, meeting you in person properly. Um, but seems like uh, the world had different ideas this um, academic year, so we're having to do things slightly differently. So virtually it was very nice to engage with you um, and I look forward to meeting you very soon. I hope you enjoy your summer. Um, you will all uh, receive some kind of results this, um, this summer and I, I really hope that they are what you what you hope for because I know the vast majority of you um, that I do know on here have worked incredibly hard and I look forward to um, having you as my year 12 class um, in the academic year of 2020-21. So yeah thank you very much and I will hopefully see you very soon.